What's up, Street Talks? Eric Kim from the Eric Kim Street Photography Blog. So, this is week two of All the World's a Stage and Introduction to Street Photography. And so, we're going to talk today a little bit about the history of street photography. So, the easiest way to find the history of street photography, just Google Eric Kim Street Photography History. And I've written a very long article on the history of street photography and lessons you guys could learn. So, you could just click on the first link, the history of street photography, it's pretty long. Or Eric Kim, learn from the masters. So I've made uh, a series of articles on the masters of photography. And so you just click the, the first link. I spent a lot of time making a cheat sheet, 100 lessons for you book, and a beginner's guide to the masters of street photography. So there's a list of all these masters. And today I'll essentially just kind of give you a bridge version. So first of all, this is just, this is kind of mostly chronological and it doesn't have any real structure to it, but um, I hope this could just give you a, a general flavor of uh, the masters of photography. So first things first, uh, one photographer who is really, really important and is actually not that famous, his name is Andre Cortez. And he was essentially the predecessor before Henri Carter Besson. Henri Carter Besson, I think he met Andre Cortez a little bit later in life, but when uh, Cartier-Bresson looked at a lot of Andre Cortez's work, he's like, wow, Andre Cortez was the true innovator in photography, even though they didn't really know each other a lot earlier. So Andre Cortez is actually older than Andre Cartier-Bresson. So I guess in the terms of the timeline of street photography, I would actually start with Andre Cortez. So if you just kind of take a look at some of his images, some of the things that um, I've personally learned or gleaned from him is the importance of shooting from high angles, looking down, the importance of the nice composition. So you can see all the different spaces between this subject here about to go here, this subject here about to go here, this subject about to go down, this subject walking down, and this bicycle about to enter the frame. And so when you're shooting street photography, one practical tip is, you know, try to space your subjects uh, equally distant from one another and also try to shoot from high vantage points. Another great photograph is just the mystery of this, uh, this shadow here on the left, very minimalist. Also another great photograph by him is, I love all these kind of mysterious leading lines. Uh, a very classic composition, you could see all these umbrellas and this cherry on top, this little down arrow here. Walking up the stairs, shot in the park. One of his most famous shots, he kept revisiting this spot over and over again until he got the decisive moment of the train crossing on top and this man holding this painting crossing in the foreground. So a practical lesson we could learn in street photography is if you see a good scene or a background, you think there might be a good shot, keep going back and try to shoot it. And a very surrealistic shot right here of a man's arm sticking out of a fan. And very beautiful, nice natural compositions inside the home. All right, so that's Andre Cortez. Next guy, Henri Cartier-Bresson. So if you are interested in street photography, you have to essentially know Henri Cartier-Bresson. He's like the Michael Jordan of uh, the photography world. He's personally had a huge influence on me and he's probably the single most important photographer who's lived so far. Uh, traditionally, he was uh, a painter, so he learned a lot from composition and he applied it to photography. And he called the camera nothing but an instant sketchbook. And looking at some of his images, you could kind of see his, uh, his training. And one of the, the important things I really want to note about Henri Cartier-Bresson is he coined the term, the decisive moment. And he actually got the phrase from some poem somewhere. And I always had the misconception that the decisive moment was just one photograph that you made. But in reality, even Henri Cartier-Bresson himself, the master, would take lots of different photos of the same scene to, in order to get the one great shot. And so one of his famous quotes is, sometimes you had to milk the cow a lot to just get a little bit of cheese. So even in this photograph, you can see all, this is his first photo and not all of his photos are the best in the first frame, but this one was. But when he was shooting, obviously he's shooting film, so he can't look at the LCD screen so he doesn't know what's getting. So you can see how he's kind of worked the scene, shooting horizontals, verticals, taking a step closer, taking a step back. And he, he said about composition is, 
composition should stem from intuition. So after he would shoot a lot of his photos, he would actually print out his photos, take tracing paper, and draw marks over his images to better understand his own compositions. Another classic uh, composition of his. And I'll just kind of whiz through these so I'm not too boring. Um, another photographer who's very important, Alfred Stieglitz. He was actually also one of the OG classics, uh, original gangsters, and he is one of the first persons who brought photography to the art world, and he recognized that photography could indeed be art. So he's also someone who's very important though, in terms of the history of photography. And a lot of uh, his early photography, so he's actually older than Henri Carter Brisson as well. He shot with an 8x10 large format camera as well by, as, um, I think a lot of these were shot on his quote quote handheld 4x5 large format camera. So we complain about our DSLRs being heavy. Back then it was a lot heavier. And you can see all these different classical compositions. And often I'll look at these old photos. I'm like, eh, the photos aren't that great. What's the big deal? The difference is that back then, I think technically photography was just a lot more difficult. And you know, obviously you don't have iPhones, which are very easy to shoot with. And having said that, I am a huge fan of shooting street photography on smartphones and iPhones. I don't, uh, I don't poo poo on them. But once again, the technical difficulties were a lot more difficult. So for example, shooting in dark snow, you know, I don't even know what speed ISO they had. Maybe like ISO 50 film, ISO 25 film, ISO 10 film, less than ISO 100. So you could imagine how difficult it is to hand hold and capture all these photos of everyday life. The next street photographer, and this is, we're going a little more contemporary. So Andre Cortez, Andre Cartier Besson, and Alfred Stieglitz, some of the OGs, so they're just like super classic. Now we're getting into slightly more contemporary. Uh, a lot of these photographers uh, are dead. Unfortunately, Gary Winogrand is dead too. But he was probably one of the most prolific street photographers who lived. He, there's stories of him walking down the street and taking a roll of film, aka 36 photos, in just a block or half a block, which some photographers will take a whole day or even a week or even a month to photograph. So some people call him the world's first uh, digital photographer. And why he's important is that he shot with a 28 millimeter lens. He, was, he got very close and he shot uh, very aggressively. And what I love about his images is that he just kind of loved life. He, he had no fear when he was out shooting in the streets. He would shoot close. And a lot of his photos had these untraditional compositions, such as the Dutch angle, which has nothing to do with the Dutch people. It actually means Deutsch angle, which is the German angle. A lot of German filmmakers used to use this technique where they slightly tilted the camera a little bit to the side to make the photos feel a little more uneasy. And one of the biggest takeaway points that I got from Gary Winogrand is, once again, when you're shooting street photography, just embracing life and living life to the fullest. Next photographer to study, William Klein. So you might have seen this photo before, kid with gun. And so what's very famous about this image is that you see this kid is pointing the gun and it just makes you feel very anxious and you know, scared. And a lot of people say street photography should be unposed and you shouldn't prearrange stuff, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the great thing about William Klein is that he was kind of like a director on the streets. So the story behind this photo is saw some kids playing with toy guns and told the kid, hey kid, look tough. Then the kid just stares at him and then points the gun at him and just kind of gave him this nasty look. Because if you actually look at the, the original uh, contact sheet, let's see. Uh, so if you actually look at the original contact sheet of this kid, he was actually not that scary or bad. Um, and you can see that all photos are essentially lies. You just take half a second. Uh, here. So here's the, here's the contact sheet. And so you could see the first shot, kids all dang, and then the vice shot, next shot, the kids are all just laughing. So when it comes to shooting street photography, you don't feel like you have to be a street photography ninja. Often interacting with the kids on the street or people you meet could make a much more interesting image. And also what's very important about Klein is he's one of the first street photographers who innovated this use of grain, out of focus, blurry photos, shooting with a very wide angle lens back in the day where you had to shoot super sharp and focus images. So his photos have a lot more life. And he inspired a lot of other photographers like Daido, Moriyama, um, Anders Peterson, as well as Jakob Asobol, who are all just kind of shoot high contrast black and white grainy images. They're all 
influential to one another. Also, what I love about how close you would get to the subjects, shooting with a 28 millimeter lens, getting all these different layers in the photograph. And one tip you could do is shoot with a wide angle lens, a 35 or a 28 millimeter, and pre-focus too on the subjects on the extreme background. So you can see in this photograph, this woman in the foreground, she's totally blurred and out of focus, but all the other faces in the background are sharp and stacked on top of each other. All right, continuing. So Diane Arbus, another contemporary of uh, William Klein's. So you guys might have seen this image. So first of all, take a look at the image, what's so weird. Yep, the, the look in the kid's face, this dinosaur claw here and the grenade. So it's a very anxious, uneasy feeling image and you know, straps also falling off the side. And the, the thing that Diane Arbus was really uh, famous for is stopping people on the street and making portraits of them. So once again, I think one good way to shoot street photography is yeah, just stopping people on the streets and asking for permission. So one thing I love about Diane Arbus is how close she got and how intimate her photos were. And not only that, but a lot of her photographs show kind of marginalized people on the edges of society and c captured a lot of really strange, haunting type of images. And unfortunately, she committed suicide later in her life. And, you know, she was uh, famous for photographing a lot of uh, transgender people before it was as acceptable in society. Very political images. This image of a boy says, God bless America support our boys Vietnam and I think this says bomb oh, I forget what this is I think it might say bomb Hanoi or something I'm not sure sorry um, she photographed people at the circus people on the streets and uh, so another photograph she took I'm proud and you could just see this guy essentially looks like a zombie and one thing that I learned about Diane Arbus is that you should really open up your heart when you're shooting street photography is that she herself was pretty emotionally troubled growing up. And so when she shot on the street, she shot with her, her heart, she shot with her soul and really connected with other people that she felt were on the fringes of society. All right, moving on. So my buddy Lee Friedlander, uh, he's still alive, still very prolific. What I love about him is just got a very wry sense of humor, very famous for shooting self portraits, urban landscapes, and I'll show you guys some of his images. And what I love about Friedlander is he's very influenced by jazz music. And the way he likens street photography, it's kind of like improvisation on the streets as well. And so one of his famous images of him stalking ladies, photographing his own shadow on the back of people's heads. Self-portrait of himself, you could see how surreal this image is, is. You see that reflection of himself in the mirror. I think it's a mirror, and this is a storefront. Uh, this kind of witty images like this the, at an airport, the number eight framing the nose and this guy under here. And also he does series of just photographing faces and TVs. So when I look at Lee Freelander's work, he essentially just kind of taught me to not take myself too seriously in photography and just kind of have fun with it. He's also very famous for doing a lot of um, other projects where he's just you know, photographing numbers photographing letters, street scenes, and uh, a lot of urban landscapes and so forth. All right, so these photographers, Gare Winogrand, William Klein, Diane Arbus, Lee Friedlander. There's some kind of the, I guess I would call them, so the, there's the really old school photographers then there's kind of more of the, I don't know, I guess more of the classic photographers. And now I'm just gonna show you guys some personal favorite contemporary photographers I know. So my buddy Josh White, a very good friend of mine, a street photographer from Seoul, he really shot me the importance of making your photos, especially your street photography, personal. He photographed a lot of his loved ones and I wanna show you guys some of his images. So, a uh, really sad story about my buddy Josh. So, Josh, I hope you don't mind me sharing this story. Uh, Josh's father, unfortunately, drowned in, uh, in an accident. He was, uh, I think they are boating. It was his, uh, my buddy Josh's mom and his dad. And I think they're rafting or something. And that day, the water's really strong. 
the water, uh, the mom falls out of the boat. She's kind of drowning. Dad jumps in to save her, saves her, but unfortunately the dad uh, by then lost power and he drowned to death. And my buddy Josh spent a lot of time shooting street photography and he kind of realized, why is it that I spent all this time photographing strangers, but very rarely my loved ones? Because before his father's funeral, he realized he had actually had very few photos of his father. And so now even he's in, in, influenced me so deeply because obviously I'm still very passionate. I love street photography, but to me, photographing my loved ones is actually more important than street photography. And even when you're shooting street photography, I think the point is putting your heart into the shoes of the subject or into the heart, uh, shoes of the viewer. And apparently this photograph is actually Josh's dad's favorite image. And so I look at this image and what I love about it is just how open-ended it is, is. You have this man on this horse at the beach looking out to this, uh, to this boat. So there could be a lot of metaphors for a man about to start his journey in life or maybe he's at the end of his journey in life. And once again, just putting your heart and soul into your images is gonna make you a much more personal street photographer. Uh, this is actually one of my uh, profile pictures and Josh photographed it for me. So we went to this uh, coffee shop and we were actually inspired by this other portrait we saw of, um, I think it's of uh, Truman Capote or actually, I uh, forget his name. But anyways, he'd shot this photo on just his point-and-shoot Sony camera and used his iPhone as a, as a light. And uh, a photo that he shot on his iPhone, I don't know, iPhone 3 or iPhone 4, but he's, uh, he also teaches English. So even capturing these candid moments of these kids kids playing, and this is one of my favorite photos, this kid with the tape over his eyes and this kid here on the side. So Josh, he shoots with a bunch of different cameras. And one thing he's inspired me is that you don't need to have a great camera to be a great street photographer. Moving on, uh, my buddy Blake Andrews. So he runs a very, very good photo blog. He's probably one of the most prolific bloggers that I know. And the reason I love Blake Andrews' work is that he flips traditional street photography on its head, is that he's shooting mostly urban landscapes and he's just got a very sharp eye. He's photographing scenes that a lot of people don't no, and they don't quite understand and I think is on a different level from most photographers out there. So even photographing scenes like this where the legs are just walking or let's see what else you got here. Uh, making images of uh, the street lamp post and it's like, you know, what is all this glitter coming at? It looks like it's something from uh, a movie and all of his photos are shot in black and white film. He develops and posts himself. A photo inside is inside his home, just this little fish looking at him. A photo he shot in San Francisco. What is he painting, right? Urban landscapes. And just a very, very witty photographer, like even this photograph of this clown, half his head. And, so, and even shooting quote quote street photography inside his home these kind of surrealistic moments like the, the dash inside this it's like a Lego as well as the windows here. It also looks like it could be part of this guitar here. And uh, the last uh, contemporary favorite photographer I have, his name is uh, Jakob Asobol. He, man, he, he just shoots with so much depth and soul. Um, he often goes, photographs either strangers on the streets or knocks on people's doors and uh, some of his more provocative images, he even photographs people having sex. And the importance of his images is that he's able to kind of capture a deeper level interaction with the subject. So even photographing strangers on the streets. And his photos are just very ghostly and cool like, but just seep with the soul. His is one photographer I aspire to, to shoot like. And so this is just a very basic introduction to some, a very, very brief history of street photography. So once again, if you want a more in-depth history, search history, street photography, Eric Kim. Uh, one cheat that I do often is I just Google, because I forget what I've written. Just Google Eric Kim, whatever, and you can find it. So I've done a very long feature on the history of street photography. If you want to learn more about the history of street photography, the book I would actually recommend Bystander, A History of Street Photography, Colin Westerbeck, and Joel Meyerowitz. It's very in-depth. 
I've done this very in-depth article in terms of uh, the history of street photography. So hopefully this could give you, uh, this presentation could give you some new insights on street photography. And until next time, uh, I'll see you guys in week three. Peace out.